running sentences presents The Hapless Nomadic Cook, Episode 4, A New Drink. When Grubber returns home from his trip away, he finds that a new drink has been discovered. The only problem is that no one wants to be the first one to try it, or figure out how to get it. This is a work of fiction. Any and all characters, names, and places are products of the author's imagination. Any resemblance to actual people, real, living, dead, or actual places is purely coincidental. This is also not meant to be a realistic portrayal of what history might have looked like. It is merely a fictional thought experiment to see what the characters can get up to. Copyright 2021. Michael Honore. All rights reserved. The woods had taken on a familiar feel to them as Grubba continued to follow his friends on their way home from their long trip. Though he didn't recognize exactly what that meant or felt like, other than the odd sensation of things looking right, they continued to work their way through the woods as best they could. The journey was soon over as they emerged into a clearing that would reveal their little home town in front of them. This little place wasn't busy looking and apparently wasn't expecting them back as no one came to greet them. However, when they finally did get to where the huts began to spring up and the few people began to notice and they began to whisper amongst one another and also grunt as the foursome walked past, the group continued on towards the home of Mugga, though they were gathering a group of followers as they went. This was all very confusing to Grubba, who was wondering why they weren't being approached, but followed at a distance behind them. Uh, guys? What's going on? Bounce looked over at him with a shrug. I've never done these trade missions before. Uh, what, what do you think, Arms? It's odd, but not that big of a deal. I guess it's because we spent so long over there and that it caused them to believe we'd never be back. Sticker looked back from his position in front with his pointy sticks resting on his shoulder. It's first time for me as well. I don't know what's going on. This didn't help Grubba, who felt like the people who he knew, bit not all that great, but slightly, were all staring at him and the group. They clambered up the little hill which Mugga's hut of an abode was stationed on, and set down their baskets of goods, and thankfully only a handful of Bounce's favorite nuts were remaining, most having been already eaten on their journey. They were greeted by Maga's partner and wife, Waves, who stood in the front of the hole of the door. She looked over them carefully as they stepped up. Eh, you want to see him, eh? Well, best get in and I'll keep a watch over your stuff. The hut was much like Grabba last remembered it. A mess of children running around making as much noise as possible with sticks in their hands. Occasionally, these sticks were swung at one another. Mugga sat in the center of the hut, looking rather tired and barely noticed them as they came in. Sticker marched firmly up toward Mugga and came to attention in front of the man. Sort of. It was sort of an attention anyway. Leader, we have returned to glorious trade goods. Huh? Oh, you four are back? Was the trade deal any good? Mugga looked up tiredly at them. Ah, uh, not exactly, sir. The, uh, the village was closed down as people said they were cursed. They gave us some goods and then we left. Free goods? Well, oh, that's great. And I'm glad you're all back safely, I suppose. Sort of, anyway. We've had a tough week or so and we had our own traveling traders come to us. Caused quite a problem. Well, why is that, sir? Mugga rose from his spot and went over to a nearby basket that was by the wall. He grabbed it and then dragged it as if it contained something heavy and came to a stop in front of the group. Then he lifted off the lid. A rancid smell soon came out of it and not wanting it to take over the room, Mugga slammed the cover back over the whitish substance. What was that? Bounce had moved over towards the basket, poking it with her foot as Mugga tried to chase her off. We don't know yet. Well, we know, but we don't know exactly. It's a sort of drink, we think. No one wants to try it yet. Then he headed out of the hut with the four returning members following, though they were a bit confused as to why they were suddenly being left here. Upon exiting, they saw that Mugga was already ordering a few citizens that were still around to clean up the baskets of newly acquired stuff. 
Then the man headed down the little hill overlooking the town. The four of them, still sort of bumbling along, followed behind, trying to see what was going on. They walked and walked, cutting their way through the ramshackle huts with Mugga in the lead. None of them dared talk as they all followed, because what else was there to do, and they didn't really think of anything to say, which left it up to Grubber to come up with something, even though he didn't know what he was going to say. Uh, Mugga? The leader came to a tired stop. Yes, what is it, Grubber? What's the problem now? I was just wondering where we're going? Our new storage hut next to the cookhouse. You'll see. For his effort to question what was going on, he got pushed by both arms and bounce as they went past. He was confused. It was a perfectly simple question, but they seemed to have thought it was a bad idea to ask it. Still, he got moving again and they followed Maga. Their little journey walked a bit past the brand new storage hut that had been built and they came to a stop next to a dirt wall fence that had many stones in it, and that rose very well above what they normally would think of. It was attached to the side of the storage hut, and they couldn't really see anything in the side of this little area that Mugger had stopped by. He signaled that they should climb the wall, and so the foursome did. Inside the fence, they found a brown moo animal that had its face down and was eating some grass. The group atop the wall stared at it. Arms seemed to be the first one to be able to find something to say. What does a moo have to do with liquid drinks? I'm glad you asked, Arms, because I don't know either. The trader who we sent away with much salt and gave the basket that you saw and this creature to us in return. Their eyes all turned to Grubba, who was staring at the animal and then realized he was being stared at. Um... Have fun with this. Bounce then jumped off the wall. I think I need to go help with those supplies. And with that, Arms joined her off the wall. The two then both quickly backed away and were gone, leaving just Sticker and Mugga standing near him. Sticker, however, didn't hang around, having jumped off the wall on his own without saying anything, and just wandered away. This left Mugga staring at him. I'm trusting you to figure this out, since you're one of our best cooks and... You have yet to produce any bad results. Get to work, Grubba. Grubba could only stare at the moo, who promptly mooed at him. Instead of trying to figure out how to get a drink from the animal, he figured it would be a good idea to get his old friend Vaka to help out. But to do this, he first needed to know where the other cook was. He jumped off the wall of the encasement of the area where the... Moo was being held and headed into the storage hut to see if maybe, perhaps, the cook was in there. Since the bright ball was reaching the top of the sky and was beginning its descent towards the other side. Except Vaco wasn't there, and Grubba found himself getting in the way of people who were bringing in stuff that his little trading party had brought to town. He quickly abandoned the storage hut. His next choice was the cook hut. He figured that a cook, if not gathering supplies, should be cooking. But alas, when he came into the open hut, he found two women who Vaka had worked with and were trained to cook were there. He looked about to see if the man was hiding somewhere inside the hut, but since there wasn't really room to do that, he turned to them. Um, do either of you know where Vaka is? They both looked over him a bit coldly. He blinked back at them, figuring he probably deserved some of this coldness, since he hadn't gotten around to learning their names, or what they were capable of, or that the, they could cook, or anything really about them. Listen, I'm sorry. Try his hut, and don't speak to us. He backed out of the hut, figuring that he should deal with those new cooks. But at the present moment, he didn't really have time. And, well, Vaka was a little more important as his weird ideas tended to get him out of trouble. Grubba found himself hurrying along the pathway from the cook hut towards the rows of huts passing by people who seemed surprised to see him. He thought about stopping, but they all instantly looked away once he saw them looking at him. It was all very strange, and he swore to himself that in order to not have a history repeat itself, he would get to know people this time around. But, for now, he reached Vaka's hut and ducked inside. 
Things were not looking up when Greba's eyes adjusted to the side of the hut. A sinking feeling of something was wrong, and where it was Vaca rang about in his mind, all because the man with the weird ideas was not in his hut. Not wanting to waste any more time, though, he backed his way out. He would just about arrive back at the cooking hut with no hopes of anything other than helping to cook. He hurried along to the pathway, though, keeping an eye out for his old associate without hoping to locate him. The man was an oddity who went off and did whatever he wanted with impunity, since he was related to Maga. Grubba once again was back in the cook hut, but now looked for, for something to do cooking-wise instead of searching for Vaca. He did his best to stay out of the way of the two women, who seemed more interested in turning meat over a fire than in him. But gathering greens and other colored things that tasted okay was soon boring. He bit his lip trying to come up with a way to ease his way into the situation of talking. What are you even doing here? The question caught Grubba off guard. He hadn't been expected to be confronted about his job. He was assigned as a cook, remember, Journey? Him and Vaca were the first ones. Oh, right. Still, Nap, I don't think we need someone useless like him around. I am not useless. I sometimes cook. I am a sometimes cook who has helped out the tribe, and I have discovered foods, and I have helped you avoid foods, and I'm just here to help get food out to those here who are busy during the day, until Mugga and his great infinite wisdom gives me a new job. The two women looked over him carefully. The look told him that they did not trust him at all. He sighed as he continued his work, trying to figure out which greens and colored foods would be good to eat. The good thing is that he now had an idea of their name. Journey was the taller of them, and a bit muscular. Nap, on the other hand, was stout and a bit rounder. He committed the names and the looks to his mind so that he could remember them in his drive to not get driven out of the village. The afternoon soon slipped into the evening and the line of people seeking food soon outside of the hut. Grubba did his best to help, though feeling like he was still getting in the way no matter what he did to help out. This, though, was soon done, and he had nothing left to do with the little supplies that were remaining in the cooking hut. So he gathered some food to keep his appetite satisfied, and went off from the cooking hut feeling like he hadn't done much today. And he felt in his thoughts that he'd been, he managed to keep the lead, his leader, Maga, happy. Plus, he'd proven that cooking wasn't just his thing. He could help out in trading with goods. But he had also helped out with cooking, so, yeah. And the two women would soon realize that he was helpful, he hoped. But those thoughts bangled about his mind as he hurried his way towards his own sleeping hut. When he got back, he found Drubba, his hut partner, resting on his side inside. The big man was busily eating away and picking at the food he had been given. Grubba did his best not to get in the way as he settled on his other side of the hut. He, too, started eating and thinking about this moo creature. Without Vaca, there probably wouldn't be a solution, at least one that he could think of, as his mind just simply didn't, couldn't put together how one might get a drink out of a creature. He jumped when a piece of meat landed in his lap and glanced over at Drubba, who waved his hand at him to lay down. Looked like you could use it, and the way you were staring and thinking. I guess Mugga gave you a task. You'll get to it, you'll think of it, and you'll do it. The big man then turned over, and Grubba soon found himself looking at the man's back. Uh, thank you. There was no response as Drubba, who was always a quick sleeper, began a soft, loud snore. With nothing left to do, Grubba quickly ate his food and then too hurried to sleep. He awoke early the next morning and hurried from his hut, which had already been abandoned by Drubba, who he believed was already off on another hunt. Grubba, on the other hand, found himself once again outside of Vaka's hut after leaving his own, and wondering if he should go in and see if the man had magically come back or not. He jumped in surprise when Vaka, looking a little off, crawled out of the opening and then popped up to a standing, a little tipsily. Oh, Grubba, I'm glad you're back. Great, we could use some help in the cookery. Uh, yes, uh, I'm already doing that. 
Where have you been? And I do need your help. This did not seem to register with Vatka, who had already begun walking down the path. Grubba soon was walking behind him, trying to catch up. You need help? That's a first. So what's up? Well, you were around when Mugga, our great-grand tribal leader, made the trade for the Moo. Oh, yes, yes, indeed, yes. Great, because I need to know how to make a drink appear from that creature. You're the only one who I can think of who would come up with a way to do so. Upon hearing this, Baka came to a stop to think about it. Grubba, on the other hand, did not stop as he continued straight for the storage hut. When Vaka caught up to Grubba at the storage hut fence, where the moo was moving about carefully looking for some grass, Grubba had gotten up on the stone and dirt structure. He stood unsteadily on the fence and then decided to jump in. Now firmly on the ground, Grubba found himself face to face with this moo. The creature, however, didn't seem to like that he was there, and it moved to get away from him. Grubba took a step forward. The creature stepped backwards. Vaka, having decided to clamber up onto the wall himself, was watching the whole situation go down. Listen, creature, I just want to touch you. I'm not here to harm you. But every step Grubba made led to the moo trying to get away, despite the enclosed space. Perhaps you should chase it. Grubba looked over at Vaka with a questioning look, who offered a shrug and a grin. It was an idea, and just about the only one he had. So... He turned and began to the pursuit of the animal, taking several steps forward. The wild legs of the moo, however, kept him at a distance as he chased it around the small space until they were both exhausted. Grubba did his best to clamber back over the fence once, with Vaka's help once he'd run out of energy and was no longer interested in trying to touch the moo. He came tumbling down to the other side of the fence into a heap on the ground. He was slow to get up, not because of any injuries, but because, well, he hadn't had anything to eat yet, and, well, he decided it was best to get some food in him after all of that work. Vaka had jumped back down and was now beside him again. So what now? Food. Then we need a plan. Having got up, Grubba meandered his way into the storage hut with Vaka. They didn't spend long in the hut, both grabbing a few things, and they were soon out of there, eating and nibbling on stuff, and Vak was using this time to just sober up a little bit. They had gotten as far as a nearby field and sat down to further eat their fruits and vegetables that they'd grabbed, Grubba soon laying on his back to think, while Vaka merely stared off. Vaka? Yes, sir. You seem strangely iffish. Have you been eating those mushrooms? Oh no, I had a drink that came by from some round balls. You know the things that were growing nearby the ocean on the vines? Big shaped things, but when you eat them, they're a little tasty, but somewhat unsatisfying. No. Oh, right, you haven't met the god of the woods, or, well, the lady of the woods is there as well. She might also be called the lady of the woods. Can't remember. Anyway, she knows a lot about things and made a drink out of those little round things. It was quite punchy. I have had an idea for food that will help you out, Grubba. Well, that's kind of what I was hoping for. What have you got? The animal, the moon, must make some sort of liquid. Just like those round balls, those juicy balls or pebbles or whatever they are. Okay, how, why, where do we find this drink from the animal? We must squeeze it. Vaka, having jumped to his feet and shaken off the slight doldrums that had been his hangover, looked about the place with energy, and then raced off, not waiting around for Grubba. He was soon gone from sight as Grubba was slow to sit up and then and just caught sight of the man running just off towards town. <sighs> with a sigh, Grubba rose to his feet and checked that he'd eaten what he'd brought with him before heading back on his own. He just arrived back at the exterior of the storage hut and was looking about for Vaka, or where he'd run off to. Fortunately, he didn't have to search very much. As the young man was rushing about atop the stone dirt fence wall that it was used to keep the creature, the moo, in. Then, the man suddenly jumped off into the moo's area. Grubba found himself clambering his way up to see what was going on. As he got to the top, he saw that Vaka was rushing around after the poor animal, much like he had. 
The sight was ridiculous, and he felt for the animal as Vaca kept making squeezing motions with his hands at it. Ahem! Grubba glanced over to see that Journey had her hands on her hips and was looking very disappointed at the fact that he was sort of laying on the fence, half on it, half off of it, with his face in the moose section. He tried to slightly turn and to face her. Do you need help with something, Journey? Where is Vaca? And why aren't you helping out with the cooking? He merely pointed inside the fence. Our friend is in there with the moo, trying to make a drink by squeezing it. I don't know how, and I don't know if it will work, but that's the task our great leader Mugga put to me. But do you, you want our help? A big animal was brought to the cut hut yesterday. We need you and Vaca to carry the meat so that we can cook it before it all goes off and then we don't have anything for the rest of the villagers to eat. Vaca had given up on his task of chasing about the animal and clambered back up to the wall as Grubba slid his way downward. Having been thoroughly yelled at by Journey, the two men made their way to the place where the meat was cut up. They were waiting while Butcher chopped things into manageable sections. Vaca looked deep in thought, which Grubba wasn't entirely sure was a good idea, while they waited and decided to break apart the quiet. Butcher, have you ever cut up a moo? A moo? Let me think. A quiet fell over the hut as Butcher went back to work. Do you think, Grubba, we're going about the moo the wrong way round? To this, Grubba looked over, then shook his head, then looked over again. Question from Vaca that didn't make any sense. The wrong way around? He thought to himself. They hadn't even gotten close to the creature to see what it could do, and of course they were the wrong way around the whole thing about it. Yes, Vaca. Yes, we're the wrong way around. Oh, I was hoping you'd say no, and so I could try again and see if it was on the upside. I thought about it, I thought about it, and yes, I did once cut one up, lots of meat from it. Why? We're trying to get a drink out of it, Butcher. A drink? How? By squeezing it. Don't know anything about any of that. I see. So you don't know which parts might be squeezable? The Butcher gave them a long, hard stare. That said that it was getting to be a bit much for him, these questions. Grubba took this hint and shut up, letting the cutting get done. Butcher soon finished up his cuts and handed over a piece to Vaca, and then one to Grubba, who headed off to the cooking hut so that the meat could be finally cooked. As they carried their first load of meat over to the hut, Vaca had once again slowed down to think as he walked. Grubba slowed down his pace to match, and was trying to get Vaca to pick up his pace once again. We need to find a way to get the mood come to us. How, though? Well, it was unhappy with us, Vaca. It was boxed into these walls and a fence, and... Also, wasn't there grass there yesterday? No idea, but the girls might know. Vaca then sped up again, as the words came out. He was a man who wanted to do something, like he had an idea, and the only thing Grubba could do was tag along. Both Journey and Nap had refused to answer the single question put to them when Grubba and Vaca had gotten back with the first delivery of meat. They were forced to complete the task of getting all the meat and helping to cook with it before anything else could happen, which Grubba recognized as the right thing to do, but still, answers were needed and he didn't know how long before Mugga would, would wait before coming down to ask about the new drink. When the last food had been handed out to the hard workers of the tribe, then Nappa and Journey turned to them. They seemed rather indifferent but exhausted from their day's work, but willing to entertain the questions. At least that's the look Grubba figured was coming from them as they all stood outside of the hut. So what's this question you wanted to ask about? It's about the moo and where it's being kept. Yes, do you know of any way to get a drink on its good side? We need to make a drink. The two women looked shocked and confused by the grunts coming from both Mugga and Grubba, looking first at one another, then towards Grubba. We don't want any part of that. It sounds awful, and like you intend to do something odd with them. No, no, no. Mugga has ordered us to produce a drink from the animal that the 
traitor traded to it. That he got through a trade of some sort. I don't know what he did. We're just trying to figure out how we might do that. Yes, we're figuring it out by squeezing it. Will you stop telling everyone that we're going to squeeze the moo? It is getting us looks. But it is what we're going to do. Yes, but... I, anyway, journey and nap. What I wanted to know, not... I was hoping to know, is if you were around when the fence was built around this moo. I was. Journey looked over at her friend, surprised. You were? I needed to get some supplies when these two were off doing other things, Journey. So I got to see with some of the townspeople building up the fence. Oh, right. Then I probably saw it as well. Great. So did this area that the moo is now in have, you know, the green stuff on the ground that goes wee in the wind? Yep. Journey shook her head yes as well after a few seconds of thinking about it. Okay. So the moo either ate all of it or something happened to the grass. Either way, I think I need to go talk to our dear leader. He swung about and headed towards the hut as Journey and Nap merely shrugged and returned to the cooking hut to get their food for the night. Vaka, on the other hand, hurried in front of him to stop the girl. Oh, by the way, girls, if you think of anything that might help us get us drink out of the moo, please do tell us, and please, if it involves squeezing, let us know right away. He then turned and hurried after Grubba. They clambered their way across the town and then up to the hill searching for their leader, Maga, who was nowhere to be seen so far. Grubba occasionally came to a stop to see if their leader wasn't among his people, making sure that they were all right. But no, he wasn't, and so they climbed the hill towards the leader's hut. On top of the hill sat Mugga by a fire, looking at his kids, running around. His wife was beside him, watching the little ones, and seemingly out of any energy to stop them from doing their usual running around and hitting one another with sticks. Grubba crested the hill as Vaka and came to a stop. Oh, my dear cooks, do you have the drink? No, not so far, sir. Sorry. Uh, but you have a problem. I have a problem? Is it a drinking problem, Grubba? No, Vaka. Well, yes, it, it is sort of a drinking problem. But the problem is n the moo itself. You need someone to take care of it, and I'm not going to be the person who's taking that job. I'm already your cook, after all. Mugga looked over at Vaka, who was already headed over to the children to run around with them. A new job is what you're saying, Grubba. Yes. Like us, the moo needs food, and then we might be able to figure out how to get a drink out of it once it's got its fill. It needs, you know, room. All right. Let me think of who I might use. Probably have somebody tomorrow for you. And then he waved his hand, dismissing Grubba, who took the chance to head back down the hill. Having gone back to the cooking hut, Grubba retrieved what his food portion was for the evening, and so he retreated to his hut to get away from the thoughts and for some sleep and to eat some food. A rough shake would wake him up the next morning, lifting him not so gently from his grassy bed, an unfamiliar face appearing when he opened his eyes. Whoa, whoa, I'm awake. Good, good, you're the one who got me reassigned to a new job I don't want. So, you'll have to explain what it is. Oh, uh, sorry, um, what's your name? Uh, I'm Clobber. Worked with the hunters previously, but had some issues. Grubba, who's now fully awake, got up to his feet and started to head for the hole of a door, and stopped, then turned and stared at the man. Can you work with live animals? Yes, I rather like them when they're like us and breathing and all of that. Good, I, or good, I guess. Well, follow me then. They quickly got out of the hut. Wasting no time whatsoever, the duo were soon at the fence which contained the moo. Grubba had come to a stop and pointed upwards. Clobber looked confused trying to figure out what it is that was wanted of him. You need to climb the fence and get to the top of it to see the animal you'll be taking care of. It needs food and probably something to drink. Clobber nodded and started to climb up the fence and continued to climb, but kept looking back at Grubba every couple of seconds. Why are we looking after this thing, sir, Grubba? Why are we looking after this, Grubba? 
Um, did Mugga not tell you anything? Clobber merely shook his head no. Well then, we need to get a drink out of it, since the person who traded the moo to us for salt told Mugga that he could get a drink out of it. And so that's our task. Clobber was soon at the top of the fence, and then disappeared from view. Grubba stood there waiting to see if the man would reappear, or would make the same mistake that he had made and tried to chase the animal around. When the man didn't reappear, Grubba decided to grab some food from the hut and see if the animal might like any of those. As he came in, he was surprised to see Nap busily sorting through some foodstuffs in on the mostly barren ground. He stepped to the side as to not get in her way as she finished looking over what they had. Do you need any help with anything, Nap? She turned with a handful of food in her arms. Oh, no, I'm good, but I think Journey wanted to talk to you. Then, without further word, merrily headed out of the hut. Grubba decided that uh, the moo was a little more important than Journey right now, and grabbed some odd foodstuffs from the ground and headed out. Outside again, he did his best to clamber up the dirt and stone fence while holding on to the food, a task that only resulted in stuff falling from his grasp every time he tried to move up. After a couple such attempts and dropping much of the food, he wound up taking several trips up and down to get everything up on top, where it would be easier for him to help hand it down. He'd gotten to the top, and was balancing himself, making sure that he didn't kick any of the food accidentally back the way he'd come. A task which he saw some success with, as only knocking an orange-looking plant that sort of looked like a tree root off. But this kick managed to make it go inside of the fence. And it landed next to the moo, who was close by, and jumped and then hurried away as Clobber tried to corral it with having little more success than they had had the previous day. Though eventually the moo wound up coming back around to the area and sniffing at the food. Then, in a sudden motion, gobbled it up. Seeing this, Grubba sat down on top of the fence and gently tossed the remaining food to the ground below. The moo moved around carefully, sniffing at items that were being dropped onto the ground near it. Some of them it took bites out of and some of them it ignored. But... This also allowed Clobber to get closer to the creature. Grubba! He turned to see that Journey was standing below the fence and had to swing himself around to drop off of the wall. He landed with a bit of a thump on his feet and straightened out in front of Journey, who looked nervous about something. Um, what's up, Journey? Vaca told us to think about how you might get a drink out of the moo, and I had an idea. Oh, great. So what is your... Your idea? Well, it's, uh, complicated. She looked rather flushed, like she was having trouble finding the grunts to make sense of the matter and make it make sense to him, or or maybe it was something else. He didn't know. You know how when women have little ones and they feed the little ones from the things on their chest? Yes, but no, I think... I think I get where you're going, Journey, but wait, you think that the moo might be similar? It was just a thought. Well, that's all I've got right now, so thank you. He turned and headed back up the fence. He, he didn't stay up on top of the fence for very long as he went over in a flash and now stood inside the moo's area. The creature seemed to have calmed down some and was even nuzzling with Clobber, who held some of the food in his hands. Clobber, you seem to have the animal. You seem the animal seems to like you. Do you think it trusts you? Uh, no. It likes me, but it doesn't trust me yet. Yeah, it takes time, I think. Okay, but are you close enough to the animal that you can check its underside? Um, what, Grubba? Why would I do that? Grubba, of course, tried to explain in some way, in the same way that Journey had. But he wasn't sure that the message got across to Clobber, who merely looked at him crossly and then confusedly and then just shook his head no. The young get food, and well, the liquid might... The, the, when, 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 
the young, how the young, the little ones get food from women and, well, liquid might be a drink that we can use to please our leader, Maga. Clobber continued to look doubtfully at Grubba, shaking his head no, and Grubba could only throw his arms up in frustration, unable to convince the new animal man that he might want to check the animal's underside. And so, Grubba retreated over the fence once again to plan his next move. The late evening rose the moon into the sky and had left Grubba thinking for much of the day, and having found no great solution. He had, however, found Vaca and pulled him to the side. The two men made a plan that was simple, and they were in the storage hut gathering a few foods that had been collected during the day by the foragers. With their bounty in hand, they were quickly out of the hut, and they were working in this dim moonlight, with Grubba stood atop the fence as Vaca handed food up to him. The process was a slow one since the light was not very good. Hold on, I'll go get some light. Grubba was about to say something about how one couldn't just go get light, but Vaca, being Vaca, had already run off. He waited a minute, and then to his surprise, a piece of light appeared running towards him. Vaca had put a piece of wood with an end sort of glowing brightly, enough to cast some light. When he got to the fence, he tried to offer this new light to Grubba, who moved to grab it, but the heat from the end made it a hard thing to do. Eventually, Vaca had to shift the sticks to the side so that Grubba could grab it, and then get up on top of the fence himself. The two were soon on top of the fence, and then, kicking down the food, hopped down into the moose area. The glowing light brought the creature from its sleepy state over towards them as they tried to figure out as it tried to figure out what was going on. It soon caught the scent of food and nosed its way towards them, the scent being one that it liked. Grubba made sure to stand clear as Vaca held on tightly to his makeshift light. You explained it before, but explain it again to me. Okay, Vaca. You need to check the bottom side of the moo for anything unusual. Like the others in our tribe, the ones with the big balls on their chest and, and nothing below. Like, and we don't have those and we have those. You know, Vaca nodded surprisingly and then ducked down to see what he could see. Then he popped up. Couldn't see. Grubba made his way over and grabbed the torch of his stick away from him, and held it low to provide light to the underside of the moo. In response, the moo moved a little bit away, get away from the heat, but stayed around eating the food. Vaca once again ducked down to see what was going on, and then came back up again. Well, anything on? Yes and no. So there's, there's, there's nothing like the balls on the chest. Instead, there's a thing like us dangling between the legs. It's one of us. Well, as far as I know, we don't produce baby food, so this is a bust of a mission. Uh, I guess we can get out of here? The two then proceeded to scamper back over the wall with their little light and headed back towards their huts. Grubba found himself standing outside of Maga's hut the next morning, pacing about trying to figure out how to explain this and how to tell the story of how a drink wouldn't be happening when the leader emerged from his home and looked over at him. Drink? No, but I tried, and, um... Maga raised his eyebrows in surprise and then put his hands on his hips. Care to explain why there's no drink? The idea was that the Moo might provide a drink in the same way that other people of our tribe do to the young ones. Yes, like my mate did, I see. So this... How were you not able to get a drink? Well, I wasn't sure if this moo had the proper dangly bits or, you know, what they had and what they didn't have, like your mate does on her chest. So I got Vaca to help me out, and we discovered that the creature has dangly bits down there, but it's more like us than the uh, than your mate. To emphasize his point, he pointed down towards his own crotch, to which Mugga looked down and then up again. Since it's like us, we don't think it produces food or drinks that could help. Fine, give up for now. Besides, when one of our tribe members tried out this fabled drink the trader gave us, it made them very sick. And, well, 
they got a bad case of the butts. Kept running to the woods and letting all go. <sighs> well, I guess that's a failure that I didn't need. I'll need to find out that guy who and give all that salt to. Oh well, great. <sighs> In the meantime, I need you to come up with something interesting to make up for this failure of yours. And then Mugga sauntered off for something to do, leaving Grubba standing there with his hands still moving about trying to figure out if he had explained everything well enough. End of episode 4 Thank you for listening.